Thank you. My name is Seth Marder. I'm a professor here in the School of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Sure. And uh, I help uh, run a center called the Science and Technology for Advanced Materials and Interfaces. My research is involved in the development of materials for what's called organic and hybrid uh, electronics and photonics. And so I'll, I'll just mention what these words mean so that there is a context. Organic means it's made of plastic, okay? Now, most people think of plastic as something that you put around wires so you don't get shocked by it, but organic materials can be semiconductors and they can conduct electricity. Uh, hybrid materials, and I think maybe Shannon may have a slightly different definition, is where you have inorganic elements and organic elements intricately and mixed in such a way that the properties of the material is neither that of the organic or the inorganic, but it's a hybrid of those properties, okay? And then there are materials that we work with which are composite materials where we may have inorganic materials inside an organic matrix. And there you can still tell that the inorganics give their properties and the organics give their properties. Now, the question is why would we work on such materials for optoelectronics? And by optoelectronics, I'm talking about applications such as solar power production, uh, light emission, okay? Many years ago, I told people that there would be a day where a screen like this was not the object onto which you projected information, but it would be the display itself. So many of you may have uh, Samsung cell phones, you may have uh, Apple uh, iPhone 10s. Those have organic light emitting diodes. They're very efficient. And now LG has come up with a TV where it in fact is a screen that comes up and that is the display. Obviously, something like that can be very lightweight relative to the weight of a conventional television. And in fact, you can make solar cells that are very thin that can be printed on things of this size that can be made transparent. And these things can be made um, extremely light. And these materials based on organic and hybrid systems can be made to be um, flexible, stretchable, and conformal. And what that means is that you can use them in ways where crystalline materials may be challenging to use. So these materials are not meant to replace silicon. They're meant to complement silicon. And in some cases, they're meant to enhance the properties of silicon. So there is a kind of solar cell that's called a tandem solar cell, where you have one solar cell on top of another, and they absorb the sun's energy at different uh, wavelengths. Okay, and so if you put one of these hybrid materials called the perovskite on top of a silicon solar cell, you can boost its efficiency by a few percent, and that translates to billions and billions of dollars of savings. So what do we do here? What we do here is we try to figure out the fundamentals of what makes the materials that are going to be in these work we try to figure out how to use new chemistries so that we can make them in a more sustainable manner that avoids the use of uh, toxic chemicals, toxic solvents, reactive chemicals. And the way we do that is by a team approach, okay? And the team that I work in has people from chemistry, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, okay, electrical and computer engineering, physics, and in fact, we've worked over the years with folks in public policy, which is a great opportunity at a place like Georgia Tech. And what we do is we design from a fundamental level using quantum mechanics, molecules that have very specific properties. We then go into the lab, we synthesize these molecules, we work with people to characterize them or we characterize them ourselves, and we go and then work with people who can put these into devices, characterize them, and, and, and ultimately put them into systems. So we try to go from end to end in the team that we have working on things. This creates opportunities both for advancing the science and technology of these areas, but it also creates unique educational opportunities. The team that we have is very broad, and I'm just one of the people who are on that team, okay? And that also creates a great 
ecosystem for us to work and enjoy being at Georgia Tech. Um, now, the last things that I'll just say about this is that in the area of solar cells, silicon technology has been around for a while. I think silicon can use a quote of Mark Twain, and that's reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Okay, uh, silicon is going to be replaced by a different material umpteen times. I don't actually believe that organic materials, which are now performing almost as well as silicon, but are much lighter, are going to replace silicon anytime soon. Silicon has very, very good longevity. This other class of materials called perovskites um, is now performing as well as silicon, but it has its own set of problems. But the lightweight aspects, I think, are important for two reasons. Um, one, that for consumer electronics, they can be made and they can be made flexible. You saw that people actually just introduced a flexible cell phone recently. Um, and that's something that could be ni nice. The other thing that could be potentially nice is if you think about places, and Shannon talked about these and others did, about sub-Saharan Africa where there's not much of an infrastructure in terms of roads, okay? Having something that can be rolled up like a tarp that produces some energy to light an organic light emitting diode, which is quite efficient, provides light um, coupled with a battery for people to read at night, okay? And they don't have that opportunity uh, using a good source of power. A lot of people are burning kerosene lamps, okay? And according to the WHO, that's equivalent to breathing in two packs of cigarettes a day, every day, okay? So we see the materials that we have as being both potentially uh, useful in the first world and the third world. Now, just for closing, following on on a tradition that was started earlier, I'm going to ask everyone here a question. And it's a question that I asked because I tried to get something moving on this years ago and got interest but not traction. And that is, um, if you had in our garages, parking garages, something where you can check and fill your tires, do you think you'd find that convenient? or do you think that it, it's just something that you would do at your gas station? And would you be any more likely to you know, keep your tires filled and at the correct pressure? How many people think that they might be able to? Okay. And how many people don't think they would care at all? Okay. Well, we're getting very low turnout on that. But I, I say that only because I remember Steve Chu uh, talking about tires and the fact that we burn, I think, about 9 or 10% more energy with our cars than we would if our tires were filled. And it seems like something that could be very easy to do while we're here. So I'll stop there, and I'll go to Shannon, and then I'm going to be replacing the replacement for Natalie later. Thank you. <laughs>